Okay, well, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for asking me to talk to you, and thank you very much for joining me. And what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about microplastics with you. And just to introduce myself to anybody who doesn't um, remember where I'm from, this is where I'm actually based at the moment. So I'm luckily, lucky enough to be in the southwest of England and based in Cornwall. And this is the walk that I take every morning on the, the beautiful sunny coasts of, of Cornwall. But what many of you may not realise is that actually this is now the COVID capital of the UK because we were lucky enough just a couple of weeks ago to host the G7 summit, which was a, um, a summit where um, seven world leaders came to have their conference and they brought all of their retinues with, the, with them and brought some 30,000 people to Cornwall. So going from just about zero COVID cases, we've had a 4,000 fold increase in COVID cases in Cornwall in recent weeks. So that's something new. But moving on from that, you can see where I got my inspiration for the research that I do, because I work in environmental toxicology and I'm interested in the effects of pollution. And I'm inspired as much by the beauty of the environment around me as I am for wanting to know what it is that pollution um, does to, um, uh, to human and environmental health. So our research group has a number of key research questions that we work on. We don't just work on plastics, but we work on many other environmental contaminants as well, including crude oils and nanomaterials and different plastics addit uh, additives and um, chemicals. And the research questions that we cover are, well, how does pollution damage living things? What is it that makes some species more vulnerable than others? And more importantly, how can we use this knowledge to protect the environment and human health? Um, we don't just want to study things, we want to try and make things better. So that's been a key um, pressure and a key um, strategic aim in all of the research that I've always done. And if I move um, back to just before the pandemic started, we've done pretty well with a lot of our research and we've been delighted to be celebrated um, by some awards. And this, is, this was us, this, um, these are many of the people who are in the project just over a year ago, last February, and we were invited to Buckingham Palace and we received a, an anniversary medal, the Queen's anniversary medal in recognition of the research that we've done. And we brought that home with us. But again, the, the second reason for showing you this slide is that um, we received this medal from Prince Charles and Cam his um, uh, wife, Camilla, as you can see. And just over a week after this photograph was taken, it was confirmed that Prince Charles and Camilla both had COVID. So this is continuing the theme of COVID in, in my talk. Luckily enough, we didn't bring that home with us as well. But what was it that we were being celebrated for? What, why did we get so much recognition for the research that we were doing? Well, we were working on, on microplastics. So I don't really need to introduce microplastics to the people in this, this talk because all of you will know um, a great deal about it. It's the subject of our joint GCRF project in the first place. But we've been working on microplastics, including synthetic and natural fibres, as you can see on the left from, from textiles. We've done a lot of work on the microbeads that you can find um, added to, um, to different consumer products, or at least they were added to consumer products until um, legal bans that were brought into force just a few years ago in the panel in the centre. And on the right, the microplastics that all of us find in the samples that we study from, from all of our local study sites. Um, plastics broken down from larger items are a wide variety of sizes, shapes and colours. And of course, one of the reasons why we're so concerned about microplastics is that their size range overlaps with the food and prey item size for so many aquatic organisms that it raises concerns that they may be entering the food chain. So firstly, if I tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've done on microplastics, and then I'll move on to some of the topics that we're studying. Um, more recently. So what do we know about microplastics so far? What has our research shown us? Well, what we've been able to do is to develop the, the methodologies and then to apply them to find whether microplastics are entering the food web. And one of the first questions we wanted to know was, well, if these tiny particles of microplastic overlap with the prey item size of, of many filtering um, and marine animals, are they actually entering those animals or are they rejected before they are ingested? And we've been studying a range of animals. In the top left, you can see a little copepod called Centropogies typicus, 
This is um, one of the most abundant species on Earth, and it's found in the surface waters of the ocean, um, filtering particles out, um, of, typically of uh, zooplankton species. Um, we were able to show that um, centropogies and a wide variety of other copepods do in fact ingest microplastics, and we were able to study how long it took them to pass through the body and um, to be ingested. We also were able to study other organisms that are, are um, planktonic for only a certain part of their um, life cycle. And in the bottom left, what you can see is um, a three day old larval oyster. So this is Crassostria gigas. This is an edible oyster. And what you can see in the center is the presence of some um, tiny um, plastic nanoparticles of plastic that are present. This is roughly where the, the gut of the animal is. And we were able to study the size ranges of preference for the, the larvae and how long the particles stayed in the body. We also noticed in these experiments, and you can see in the panel on the right, that what goes in comes out. And a certain proportion of those microplastics would be immediately adjusted. And here they are present in the fecal pellets of these zooplankton. And I'm going to come back to that slide again in a few slides time and talk about what the implications might be. So bear that in mind. We were also able to show, and here we've used um, Raman spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging, which are more typically used to study um, human diseases and applied them to um, a search for the presence of plastics in, in other organs. And um, what we've been able to do is to um, uh, send laser beams deep within the tissues of the animal without having to do, do any dissections. And the um, hyperspectral imaging that we've used here detects different types of particle based on the, the vibrations of the bonds within them. So we've been able to identify that not only are, pa are plastics ingested by animals, but they also stick to the outside, mm -hmm. typically because they're hydrophobic and they have electrostatic interactions. And these could interfere with the um, function of the, the gills. Um, and this, these are the gills of a shore crab that we've collected from the shore in the UK. We're also able to apply the same kind of technique to search for the presence of the plastics in the animal's guts. And marine animals have guts of, um, of increasing or decreasing complexity. Some animals have very simple guts. Crabs have quite complex guts with, with multiple chambers. And what you can see here, excuse me, <coughs> are the presence of plastics that have been trapped by the feti that are in the, the, um, the crab guts. And what this means is that the majority of plastics might pass straight through the guts of the crab, but a certain proportion are retained and can stay in the body for quite some time. So, <coughs> excuse me. We've also been able to, to study what happens in higher trophic levels. So the, um, the graph at the top, are some results from Emily Duncan, who studied um, the presence of plastic in the guts of turtles. Now, all, all seven species of turtles are endangered. Um, they're all on various red lists. And turtles are known for traveling large migratory distances around the oceans of the world. And what Emily did was collected up post-mortem samples from stranded turtles across the three major oceans. So the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the Pacific. And what she found was of the 101 turtles that were included in her study, all of them had plastic particles in their bodies. She was also able to look at the different species and try and determine whether there was any difference in the plastics that were ingested by the different species of turtles. And what she found was it didn't matter if they were carnivorous or they were herbivorous, they all had the same kinds and shapes and sizes of plastics in them. And what this suggested was that there were probably multiple routes of uptake of the plastics into the animals, both from their prey and directly from the environment. In the panel at the bottom, these are some results from Sarah Nelms' um, research into the um, uptake of plastics by captive seals. Now, the reason she was studying a captive seals was that if you want to study trophic transfer in the, the oceans, it's very difficult to do because you've got a non-captive um, study group and you can't always know exactly what those animals are eating. But if you were to study captive seals, and there are many seal sanctuaries around the coast of the UK where injured or stranded animals are taken to recover before being released. 
so what Sarah did was she went to these various um, areas and she was able to study the seals that were in the sanctuaries. She was able to study what was in the fish that they were being given to eat and what was in the water that they were swimming in. And then she studied what the seals were actually excreting out the other end by collecting up seal scat. And she was able to show that, yes, there were plastic, microplastic particles in the fish that the seals were eating. And there were also plastic particles in the seal scat that the seals were excreting. She was also able to show some subtle differences in the nature of the microplastics in each of those samples. There were, for example, more fibres in the fish than they were in the seal scat, suggesting that there could be different time frames for the different shapes and sizes of plastic to pass through the animal's guts. And of course, um, we I can see here some results from um, another area, which all of you will be familiar with, or ma majority. This is the Galapagos Islands. And I just wanted to highlight um, a recent paper from Jen, Jen Jones, who was studying the uptake of plastics into the food web in even the most remotest of locations. And if you haven't seen it, I'm sure um, you'll be interested to go and look at Jen's paper, where she was studying the uptake into um, invertebrate organisms connected uh, collected from around the beaches of um, um, Christabel. So of course, just because plastics are there or microplastics are there doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing any harm. So our next question was what harm they were actually doing um, to the animals that were ingesting them. And I just wanted to show you a quick snapshot of some results that we um, got uh, studying um, lugworms. So lugworms are uh, a highly abundant and important species as a food source for fish and for wading birds and you'll see them typically in the mud flats along the coastline. And we were culturing um, marine worms in the aquarium and we were culturing them in sediments into which we were spiking small quantities of microplastic. And we wanted to understand whether the presence of the microplastics would affect the, the worms in any way. And what we found was that um, if the sediments contained microplastics, then the worms did less well in terms of the weight that they gained. They put on less body mass, and in particular, that they put on less lipid, which is important because if they're a food source for other animals, it suggests that they're doing less well. Um, we, one of the questions that we then answered was, well, just because you've got plastic in the sediment, perhaps it's just um, displacing nutritious material from the sediments and the worms aren't uh, doing so well because there's less food available to them. So we repeated the experiments, but instead of plastic, we added um, uh, quartz grains of sand into the sediment instead. And we found that with quartz sand, the, the worms were absolutely unaffected. They put on as much weight as they did if, there was, uh, if um, the sediments were unadulterated. So what we um, understood was that the presence of plastic um, changed subtly the way that organic matter passed through the bodies of the worms. And it seemed that the worms fed more slowly and the, their food items were retained in the gut for longer um, by the plastics. We also used the same model. We used um, lugworms, uh, um, uh, which we cultured in the aquarium for up to a month. And we studied what would happen to intrinsic chemicals within the microplastics. One of the issues with microplastics is that they release, um, uh, they contain many different additives. And one of the additives that's found in many different kinds of plastic at high concentrations are phthalates. And they're particularly found in PVC. So we synthesized PVC plastics with different concentrations of phthalates, and then we determined whether those phthalates within the PVC particles would pass into the bodies of the worms if the worms were cultured in sediments that contained them. And these results show that yes, they are. If you have phthalates in the PVC particles, then they do pass from the particles into the bodies of the animals. And phthalates are uh, highly harmful additives that have been associated with damage to DNA and damage to um, sperm, and to a number of other reproductive factors. So they are um, quite um, harmful and risky additives. And finally, we wanted to know, well, what would happen to adhered pollutants on the outside of microplastics? Would they also be carried like a Trojan horse into the bodies of the animals that ingested them? And would they actually have any effect? And in this case, we studied a different kind of microplastic. We looked at cigarette butts. And we looked at smoked cigarette butts. 
So we went around the department and we identified all the smokers and we used to get them to collect up all their cigarette butts in um, in paper bags and give them to us at the end of the week. And um, this is one of my students, Stephanie Wright, who was then examining what effect that the, the um, the cellulose acetate microfibers would have um, on her uh, model worms. And she was able to show that not only was the nicotine in the cellulose acetate butts transferred to the worms, but it could also completely disrupt their burrowing time. So the, um, the worms would no longer burrow into the sediment. And burrowing time is a, is a real marker. If the worms can't burrow, then they can't escape from predation. So it's, a, it's an important marker of their well-being. And finally, if we go back to the consequences of the, um, the uh, presence of microplastics in the fecal pellets, what fecal pellets do um, from zooplankton is that they carry organic carbon from the surface waters of the ocean down into the deep depths of the ocean in something that's called the biological pump. So they, the biological pump pulls that carbon and, and deposits it deep into the ocean. And it's an important controller for the amount of um, carbon in the atmosphere. One of our observations was that if there are fecal pellets that contain a high amount of plastic, then their sinking rate may be changed because the plastic is of lower density than the material than the, that the zooplankton would normally be eating. And what these experiments from, um, uh, from Matt Call, who now works at PML, showed and was uh, working with us for, on his PhD at the time, was that um, if he fed his copepods with um, polystyrene microplastics, then it would change both the sinking rate and the um, integrity of the fecal pellets and lead them to, be, um, to remain longer at the surface of the ocean. So the implication there is that if you had areas of the ocean where there were the ratio between microplastics and zooplankton, um, was of a certain level, then you could well hinder the passage of carbon down into the deep oceans. And there, there, there on the graph, you can see the change in the density of the, the fecal pellets. So that gives you a bit of a snapshot through some of the um, research that we've been doing on microplastics in marine animals. And I wanted to stop and give you just a, a couple of little slides on a question that I'm very often asked, and that's whether humans are exposed to microplastics and whether it actually has any consequences. And then I'll move on to our work on the circular economy. So a quick snapshot on whether humans are exposed to microplastics. Um, microplastics um, have been identified in many different filter feeding organisms. And in this study by colleagues Van Kauenberg and Janssen, they were measuring the presence of microplastics in bivalves cultured for human consumption. In the panel at the top, we can see that um, we have um, uh, edible blue mussels. And in the panel at the bottom, we can see that we have uh, edible oysters, Crassus pruitigus. And what Van Kauenberg and Janssen found was that in both species, uh, a significant um, number of the animals that they studied had microplastics in their bodies. And the graphs are just showing the size range of those different microplastics. And what they were able to do was they calculated and the mean number of particles per gram of muscle tissue. And then what they also did was they determined, well, if an average person was to eat one plate of muscles a week for a year, how many microplastics might they ingest? And they came up with the figure that an average person might consume about 11,000 particles per year of plastic from their seafood. And, and this... Uh, this statistic has been widely reported and um, it sort of brought the whole issue of microplastics to life for many people as a root of exposure of human beings. And certainly if you look at how microplastics might enter the body in, in, in humans and other vertebrates, we have specialised areas within our guts called M cells or microfold cells. And these are special narrow areas within the, the lumen of the gut. Um, and they're specialised for allowing uptake of particles into the body. And this is specifically to aid digestion and the uptake of nutritious particles. And those particles are taken up across the end cells and then they can enter the lymph and the blood vessels and circulate through the body. So there's certainly a, ro a route by which uh, microplastics of the size range from about 200 nanometers upwards um, might be taken up into the body. And certainly some of the studies that are now starting to come out are, are reporting microplastics in um, many different organs in the human body. But this is one of the first to do that. This was, um, 
this is um, a study from colleagues at the University of Vienna um, in 2019. And what they did was they did something similar to Sarah with studying her, her seals from captivity. And they took eight volunteers, so it was quite a small study, but they asked them to collect stool samples and to filter out what they were excreting at the, um, it, it, when they visited the toilet. And they then investigated what they might find in there. And they found that eight out of the eight stool samples that they studied contained microplastics. So everybody in their study was excreting microplastics in their stool. Average of about um, between 18 and 172 particles and of a size range similar to the, the size that was being excreted by the um, seals. And the majority of plastic that they found were those associated most commonly with plastic food packaging, so polypropylene and polyethylene. To give you just one example of a recent paper, this is this paper has just very recently come out. This is from Iran and this is 2021. And this is a study of human coloectomy samples. So these are small samples that have been taken from the, the body wall of the colon in a number of um, patients who've been um, sent in for surgery. And what the authors here did was that they did something similar. They took um, the, the tissues and they digested them and they determined whether there were any microplastics actually present in the wall of the colon. And again, they found 100% of their samples. So that again, small size of sample, only 11, but 100% of those people had um, microplastic particles in the, uh, in the tissues of their colon. In this case, the vast majority were fibres, including polycarbonate, polyamide and polypropylene, both associated with um, uh, sanitary items, with wet wipes, with carpets, with textiles. Um, so perhaps hinting at a route of exposure that could be used. OK, but does that actually mean anything? Is it something that we should be worried about? Um, uh, and do we know what it actually means in terms of human health? Well, if we go back to that statistic on microplastics in bivalves cultured for human consumption, and we thought that the average person consumed about 11,000 particles per year. If we look at that in terms of weight, that's probably about seven micrograms or a, a tiny quarter of a teaspoon. And if we were worried about those microplastics um, bringing contaminants into the human body, then, and we were particularly keen on looking at, say, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, which are one of the priority pollutants in the oceans that we're worried about consuming, we would find that that dose of plastics only increased our exposure by about 0.2%. So we don't really know what that, this uptake of microplastics by humans is causing, but if you look at the, the graphs on the right, they're suggesting all of the other, kind, other kinds of contaminants that we know present in the tissues of bivalves intended for human consumption that are perhaps just as worrying or a great deal more worrying organochlorine pesticides and DDT and mercury that we know that we're exposed to from people. So just raising the issue that microplastics are there, we don't quite know what they're doing. Come on. I'm just trying to make my computer move on. It's deciding it doesn't want to do that. So I'm not quite sure what's happened there. Okay, it's moved on. So why not do things differently? Let's try and see if we can um, uh, look at how differently we could do things. Well, as many of you who work on the circular economy will know, the plastics industry is not just bad because it produces a lot of waste, it's bad because it produces a lot of greenhouse gas emissions as well. And if we look at the greenhouse gas emissions from the um, plastics industry, an estimate from 2019 suggested that it produces as much as 189 coal plants and excretes it into the atmosphere every year. And if we look at the, um, uh, the, the growth of, I think there's about a 4% yearly increase in the amount of plastic that we're using. If we don't change anything, then by 2050, uh, we'll be producing about 615 coal plants worth of plastic every year. Now currently the plastics industry produces more greenhouse gases than the shipping and the aviation industries combined. It is a big contributor. So this is not what we want to be doing. And of course the answer is there for us. We can save the world, there is still time, and the answer to all of our problems is or has been postulated to be the circular economy. Um, the circular economy, as many of you will know, designs out waste and pollution. It intends to keep materials and products in use for longer. And it's by doing so to protect and regenerate natural systems. 
And in terms of plastics, there are many different things that we can do. We can recycle, we can reuse, we can reduce, we can replace. Um, there are many um, varying options for um, removing particularly single-use plastics from the supply chain. Now, not only would that be a good thing for us to do in terms of reducing plastic waste, but it would also be good in terms of decarbonizing and reaching um, zero carbon waste. On the graphic on the left, these are some results from colleagues at the University of Santa Barbara. If we look at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with our current use of plastic at 4% growth per annum, you can see that between now and 2050, we'll, we'll increase our greenhouse gas emissions uh, considerably. If, however, and these are modelled studies, if we were to adopt a circular system that, that took in a wide range of um, approaches, we used more renewable energy, we used bio-based feedstocks, we recycled and we reused, it is possible to do that without increasing the use of carbon at all. So it is possible to um, save the world. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do, or we've been attempting to do in the Exemplar project, which was a, a funded project that we've been running here in the southwest of England, along with the, the business school at the University of Exeter. We've also been working with engineers, polymer engineers, local businesses. I think we've got about 300 odd local businesses signed up. Um, we've got social scientists, we've got medics, we've got a whole range of people involved in this multidisciplinary project. And the idea was to try and demonstrate what kinds of circular economy approaches would work um, in, in the Southwest region that could then be scaled up or applied to other regions. And I've just got a few slides to show you of some of the results that we've got from those um, studies that might be relevant to our current GCRF project. So first up, we've been looking at how plastic flows through the region in the Southwest. Um, there are various potential sources of plastic waste or plastic usage. And you can see from these graphs that the, the major source of plastic flowing through the system is household domestic waste. Uh, we also have some waste associated with fishing gear and with agriculture, but they are dwarfed by the amount of plastic that passes through households every day and ends up being discarded. We can also look at where some of that plastic goes to in these, these um, material flow analyses. Um, and we can see that uh, the vast majority of the plastic waste goes into landfill or incineration. We have a big incinerator in the, in the southwest of uh, England, which takes a lot of waste. Some of it passes straight into the environment, but the majority goes into the landfill from where it, it, um, a substantial amount leaks into the environment. And the reason that that's important is it helps us to understand what kinds of interventions might be most important in the southwest region. And for that reason, we've been working a great deal on the problem of plastic bottles um, being one of the main um, contributors towards that plastic flow. So we've been looking at plastic bottles, their impacts and the solutions and the economic opportunities that those solutions might offer in the southwest region. And in particular, um, we've been involved in life cycle modeling, human health evidence synthesis, and the results that I'll show you here in terms of ecotoxicity testing. So first up, um, these, these are some of the results from the life cycle analysis, and these were done by the life cycle analysis team down in the Cornwall campus. And what they were doing was saying, well, if we were to take all of the plastic bottles out of the equation in the southwest of England and replace them with glass, what would happen to the greenhouse gas emissions associated with them? You know, would that be a better alternative or would it lead to particular problems? And in the bar on the left, you can see the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the use of polyethylene terephthalate bottles in the Southwest. And in the bar in the center, you can see what would happen to those greenhouse gas emissions if you replace all the plastic bottles with glass. And the suggestion there is that the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that would double, which is not what you want to see. However, if you applied a design intervention and you made all of those glass bottles 50% lighter, so they weren't as thick, then you could replace all the plastic bottles with glass and not increase the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a way of trying to look for solutions and trying to look holistically at what the effects of those solutions would be. And what we were doing was we were looking at different bioplastics. We were looking at bioplastics made by partner material. 
Um, and here you can see some of the plastic bottles that were made out of seaweed, carrageenan, um, algae waste. Um, on the positive side, they're made from a sustainably derived um, feedstock. They're biodegradable and on the face of it, they decouple plastic from the oil industry. So that looks like a good thing. On the negative side, they're not yet quite at the same level of performance as other kinds of plastic. They haven't had this sort of the innovation applied to them yet. They're currently more expensive. And at the moment, we don't know what the ecological effects are. So I'll give you a couple of slides of how we've been examining some of those ecological effects. The results that we can show you here, now these are some um, LC50 curves. These are the survival curves of um, some tiny um, Artemia brine shrimp. So these are uh, uh, tiny animals at the base of the food web. And we've been showing whether the, um, the biopolymers when they're made into microplastics show any toxicity towards them. And we could see um, virtually no toxicity associated with these bioplastics. So they're very, they classified as non-toxic. Um, given the level of toxicity that we could see, which was only seen at very high concentration. What we did see was that you get some growth promoting effects. It's perhaps unsurprising. We see quite rapid degradation in a water setting of these bioplastics. They degrade within a few days and they release carbon. And that carbon can be used as a growth source for the animals. So we see um, a subtle increase in growth. And one of the other effects that we see, which um, is still being investigated, is that they alter the water chemistry. So we do see subtle changes in the pH of the exposure water when we're exposing animals to these tiny plastics. We're still investigating what the implications of this might be. Now, at the moment, that's not a, much of an issue. Currently, um, only 1% of the plastics that we use are bioplastics, and 99% are your traditional petrochemically derived plastics. But the 2030 target in the European Union, at least, and probably being picked up across the rest of the world, is that um, within a few years, we would be aiming to use 65% biopolymers. And if that was the case, then we need to make sure that all of those bioplastics, um, we need to understand more about how they might alter water chemistry, particularly if we're looking at areas where we have high concentrations. So the message there is that you can't just replace and throw away. We need to be also reducing our consumption and reducing our littering at the same time. So that's me got to the end of my talk. Um, I hope I haven't gone on for too long and I hope I've covered something that, that different people will find interesting. Um, if I was to look for the research gaps that I think are still there that we might be able to plug in our project, we, we need new circular economy models that are fit for, for different regions, fit for the economies and the, the regions in which they're being applied. And we're constantly needing to look for new materials and biomate based materials that we might use. We need to understand more about the additives that we might be adding to them. Um, looking at what, what happens to those things long term in the environment and in fact, you know, wh where it all goes and where it ends up. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and thank you to all of the people um, who I've mentioned in this talk and all of the funders and happy to answer any questions.